Christian Living 101 presents a Bible class on the fundamental basics of victorious Christian living. Establish a strong foundation for conquering the trials and temptations of daily life. Increase your faith and learn to use the powerful weapons of spiritual warfare as you study with Pastor Gene Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. We're going to continue our study today on Hebrews chapter 12. We will begin reading with verse 3, which is going to be a little bit of a review, and we'll go immediately then into verse number 4 and on down through the Scripture. Now, as we prepare our hearts to study the Word, uh, we're going to ask Jim and Luke to minister to us in congregational singing. I hope you'll sing along with them and we'll enjoy the time of worship together. I've been praying every day, Lord, I've been praying every day that the circle won't be broken up in heaven far away. Oh, the circle won't be broken by and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better circle waiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from the Lord How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His glory Of His precious love Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is true. He won me to victory and he that claims in love. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power in me. I make the name of the walk again all time I may see the walk. And then I cry, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought me. A 
about the angels singing I'm happy for the angels story And some sweet day I'll sing up there A song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior for the day He sought me and thought me With his meaning and love He loved me Now, by way of review, we read uh, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 3. It says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, and as he endured all of the taunting, all of the torture, all of the agony of the cross of Calvary, went through the forces of death and, and uh, took upon himself our sin. And that includes the sin of each one of us and down through the ages of time. And he took that upon himself. And you'll remember that uh, uh, Jesus cried out unto the Father and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, the reason for that cry was because the sin that he had absorbed from you and from me and all the others through the ages was such an obnoxious thing in the face of God that God would not, could not look upon it. And so Jesus was left there hanging on the cross, bearing your judgment and mine, and causing us to come into that place wherein we could have redemption and because he was faithful even as he hung on the cross without, hear me now, without the strength and the presence of God within his life and upon his body. Now you say, oh, pastor, I've heard so many people say this. You know, Jesus was God, and God was Jesus, and, and he didn't go through anything that God didn't go through with him, and, and etc. Well, now that's not what the Bible says. And so we need to comprehend that somewhere along the line, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for you and me as a man in the flesh without the sustaining strength of the Heavenly Father because his flesh had become sin for you and me and our sin hung upon him as we've mentioned just before. Now, what does that mean unto us? It means that knowing that our sin has already been nailed to the cross, our sin has already been absorbed by the body of the Lord Jesus Christ as he paid the price and judgment for our condemnation. You and I then have no excuse for going on in the world and having one foot in the world in the ways of sin and one foot in the pathway of righteousness, we think. Now, the truth of the matter is you're either one way or the other. You're on one side of the, of the line of righteousness and against uh, sin and death, and, or you're on the other side. And so look at this now as we go on, and Paul is giving strong instruction here now as he deals with what um, uh, the church was going through in his day. Let's look at number four, verse number four. It says, you've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And then he goes on in verse 5 and says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now that word chastening means a correction. And it may take many forms. Sometimes correction comes because we go through hard and difficult trials and we have to come to the place where we discover for ourselves uh, the way of the Lord and the strength of the Lord, the power of faith and uh, the nurturing force of the word of God and we have to come to that place where by experience uh, we endure things uh, that help us to be guided into the way that is narrow and straight and, and hard to follow because of its narrow 
shown us, uh, but it leads unto life eternal in the Lord Jesus Christ and throughout the ages to come within his kingdom. And so you and I need to be reminded that whatever we're going through is not more than we can bear. The Bible teaches that in another scripture, and he said very plainly that he would not allow us to go through more than we could bear. No temptation shall be greater than we can bear. And that word temptation, you remember, means not only being tried and tested about entering into sin, but it's a word that also includes persecution and hardship and torment and uh, difficulty in the flesh. A lot of things involved in that one word. And so we look at that and we have to say, okay, if Jesus has already paid the price for my judgment, if through his blood I am righteous in the kingdom of God, I am a son of God, I am a member of the household of God, and God then is my heavenly father, and he has promised that he will watch over me, that he will sustain me and keep me, that he'll provide for me, that he will be unto me whatever I need for him to be, to be victorious in my Christian walk, then I have the courage, or should have the courage, to go on and to study the Word of God and to live it regardless of whether the day is a good one or a bad one. You know, there's an old saying that goes around, hear it often, even uh, uh, from uh, the ladies today, they're a little bit on the irritable side or the contentious side or, or somehow they feel weary and, and don't have much uh, energy within them. And they'll say, oh, I'm just having a bad hair day. Well, I want you to know that spiritually speaking, every one of us are going to have uh, the good days and we're going to have the bad hair days. We're going to have those times where everything doesn't go right. We're going to be chastened of the Lord. We're going to be directed into pathways and situations that will mature us and develop us and cause us to become strong in faith. They will enable us to look at the Word of God, claim its promises, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and apply it unto our life, and, and face whatever comes, no matter what happens. And, and remember last week I talked to you about the fact that, that we are to do that with joyous forbearance. In other words, with joy and determination that no matter what I face, I'm going to be victorious in it. God's going to see me through it. It's going to be but for a short time, and I'm going on to the mountain of victory with God's help and the strength of the Holy Spirit and the truth of his word. And so, beloved, you and I need to understand with all of our heart that whatever we face in this life may sometimes be grievous, but it's for our well-being. And God has made it very plain in Hebrews chapter 12. And so as we looked at verse 4, it said, You've not resisted unto blood. What, what Paul is saying here, Look, I've just talked to you about the saints being encircled round about you uh, that gave their lives, that uh, uh, lived miraculous lives, uh, that endured terrible things. And if you'll remember last week, I told you, yes, uh, I'm convinced that the encircled camp of the saints of God that have gone on before are aware of what we're going through. Well, I need to not necessarily correct that, but I need to make it plainer than I made it. Uh, someone said to me this week, well, Pastor, are, are you then saying that everybody knows everything I do? Uh, all the saints look upon me and know everything I do, and they know what uh, uh, I've done in sin, and they know whether I'm being faithful to the Lord or not and all that. No, that's not really what I intended to say. I was not speaking as, the, uh, an, as an individual uh, being uh, in sight of them. I was speaking of the kingdom of God as a group, as the members of the household of Christ, as the, as the Bible says, the bride of Christ. And yes, I'm convinced that those great men of God and women of God that even gave their life in torturous situations in the days of the early church and the Old Testament era, I'm convinced that they are aware what the church is going through. I'm convinced that they are aware of how we are being tormented and whether we're going to stand the test or not as a body of Christ. And I'm convinced that they're saying, come on, come on, you can do it. Look, we did it. God was with us. God did not fail us. God will not fail you. 
and we need to take from that uh, encouragement and strengthening of spirit, uh, and we need to determine within our heart, uh, I will not be overcome by the enemy. I'm going to walk in the joyous pathway of forbearance, uh, and I'm going to endure whatever faces me with a cheerful heart, because God is with me, and he has proved that through the work uh, that has already been successfully endured and accomplished uh, in his kingdom in ages past. And so we go then back to uh, verse 5, and uh, we find that, uh, as in verse 4, we have not suffered a shedding of our blood yet. Oh, we go through discomforting things and unreasonable things, and we find ourselves humiliated, and, and uh, somehow or another it's hard for us to go through uh, the trials of life that we face in this carnal body today. But we have not have been brought to the place where we've given our blood, in other words, where we have given our life uh, for the cause of Christ. Does that mean it could never happen? No, of course not. It could happen. But what it does mean is that there are plenty of examples of God's faithfulness. Uh, whether or not I have to give my life uh, uh, as a, a physical uh, entry into death, uh, or whether I just have to endure hard things here in the chastening of the Lord, uh, is um, not uh, the issue. The issue is, how will I endure it? How will I bear it? Will I be faithful in it? Will I refuse to be defeated? Will I walk in determination to serve the Lord no matter what? Uh, and uh, go on into victory on a daily basis with my Lord and Redeemer, Jesus the coming King. Now, verse 5 said, You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh that God, what does it say here? That which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Well, I want to talk about the fact that the chastening of the Lord uh, we often look upon as punishment. That is not necessarily true because, you see, God has already uh, uh, received a judgment for our, uh, our punishment, our guilt, our condemnation, because Jesus bore that at the cross of Calvary. So that issue is, is not there as long as we walk faithfully in the kingdom of God. Does that mean we'll never make a mistake? Of course not. We all make mistakes. The secret is not whether we made a mistake or not, but whether or not we looked upon it, recognized it, and repented of it, and asked God to uh, renew his cleansing upon us, and turn from our wicked way, our way of error, whatever the situation may be. And so uh, we are looking now at a situation where we need to acknowledge uh, that God is guiding us carefully through this life, through all of the tentacles of this world that are reaching out, trying to destroy and discourage. And we're being led through a maze, as it were. Uh, and we're finding our pathway as we listen to the directives of the Holy Spirit and as we realize that we are God's children. And as children, God will chasten us. Now, sometimes, yes, he will apply the spiritual rod upon us and bring us back into line. Uh, sometimes he will uh, apply the word of God as instruction and direction in a new and uh, an understanding way that we've not seen before. Sometimes he will allow us to go through uh, situations wherein we discover that we have the ability and the strength and, and yes, indeed, the intellect and, and certainly the spiritual uh, uh, impact of the Spirit of God within our lives uh, to the degree that we can make good decisions uh, and that we can determine within our own heart uh, the right pathway to follow and where we can live before an ungodly world uh, a glorious illustration of God's delivering power and cleansing power over sin and set an example of righteous living in the face of a very ugly, ungodly world in which we live. And so as Paul is instructing the church, we need to recognize that we have forgotten that we are the children of God sometimes. And sometimes we have forgotten that we are his son and his children. And we have forgotten that, yes, he will chasten us and 
correct us, guide us, and indeed insist, if I might use that word, that we abide in the righteous pathway of the straight and narrow before Almighty God, that we both might be preserved into a perfect uh, approval and blessing of God, but that we also might be an illustration to the sinful world that there is a way to live where we can live above and beyond the grasping, uh, uh, forceful sin uh, that they live within because they've never been redeemed or saved or cleansed from the sin of the world. They have never come to that point of conversion wherein they say, I will serve the Lord. As old Joshua said in the Old Testament, as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord. You may need to make that decision in your house today. And if you do, now's a good time to do it. And, and just ask God to forgive you of your sin, cleanse you and your household. Maybe each of you need to come before the Lord in prayer and ask forgiveness. And, and as you do that, make the decision, if you have not done so already, I will be a member of the kingdom of God, cleansed and purified and delivered from the bondage of the law of sin and death, because Jesus Christ paid the price for me on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood that I might live. And so as we consider those things, then we go on and we find that uh, Paul is saying, if you are walking in the kingdom of God as his children, you need to expect that he's going to be uh, chastising you and sometimes it may be quite forceful if you have a stubborn heart or a rebellious spirit or determine that you're going to walk in ignorance. You say, well, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, let, let me just share something with you. I've talked with Christians about the Word of God. Uh, they needed to hear a particular text or they needed to listen to a particular story in the Bible. Uh, and uh, uh, the answer that I would get from them is... Uh, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And especially when we talk about the times of the last days and, and how that uh, the church or the bride of Christ is going to uh, go through some dark times. And, and uh, we find so many Christians today say, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to know about it. And, uh, I just don't want to know. Well, that is deliberately walking in ignorance. And I want you to know God's not pleased with that. He gave his word to us that we might know and understand and that we might be able to discern and decipher the signs of the times and that we would be appropriately working for the kingdom of God and warning and teaching those who do not know the truth that they might come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Redeemer and Deliverer from sin and be a member in the household of God. Now, yes, uh, someone says, well, uh, is it just, uh, is it just uh, the Israelites that can be saved? Of course not. Uh, all can be saved if, as John 3.16 says, if they believe in their heart, if they repent, if they come unto God, uh, they can come to that point of victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. So the plan there is for anyone who will acknowledge that they need the deliverance of the Lord from the bondage of sin and will be converted and repent and, and accept the Lord as their Redeemer or their Savior, whatever the situation may be. Now, let's go on into uh, the rest of that verse, and it says, My son despise not the chastening of the Lord, what then? Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Oh, you say, God gets to the point where he will rebuke me? Absolutely. Absolutely. You remember when Peter made a remark to Jesus, uh, Lord, uh, I will not, I will not, I will not. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus turned to him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, was Peter Satan? No. 
but Satan was planting thoughts in Peter's mind, and Peter was activating those thoughts with the verbal declaration of what he was thinking. And you and I need to understand that if we're going to really serve the Lord, we're going to be rebuked from time to time. We can, without uh, even knowing it, uh, uh, get into a situation where we're out of order. And when we're out of order in the kingdom of God, thank God he lets the Holy Spirit rebuke us and, and directs our lives back into the place of, of total reverence and submission and, and freedom from the uh, arrogance and the uh, pride of life that the old carnal flesh so delights in. And so, yes, you need to be prepared that sometimes you may be rebuked by the Lord. And you may be rebuked through the Word of God. You may be rebuked through a revelation of knowledge that the Holy Spirit plants in your heart. Or you may feel the Spirit of God come upon you like you even hear His voice. Now, you may not actually hear a voice, but it's that plain to you. You could hear his voice. Many men have. But he, you're going to hear him say to you, you're out of order, son. You're out of order, daughter. You need to get yourself back in the pathway that I put you on and straighten yourself out and get with it for the kingdom of God. Now, God's not beyond saying things and doing things like that to bring us into obedience as children. Now, any of you parents out there who have had any activity uh, of rearing children, and if you're a parent, of course you have, uh, uh, you need to remember that you may bring them into submission outwardly, but they're still in rebellion inwardly. Well, you see, God will not put up with that. And so God will bring us to the point, whatever he has to do to bring us to the point, uh, where not only has he corrected us uh, uh, outwardly, but where we willfully and remorsefully denounce our rebellion and denounce our sin and accept his rebuke and say, thank you, Lord, for being a faithful parent to me, being a faithful father to me. And so uh, we don't want to be deceived into thinking, well, I'll say yes to God with my lips, but in my heart, I'm still going to feel the same way I always felt. Now, I, I have a situation I'm dealing with right now uh, with a, a couple of people. Uh, they're at odds with each other. They're in a situation where neither one will speak to the other. Uh, they each know that they're wrong. They each know that they ought not to do that, that they should forgive the, each other, and that they should be restored into fellowship with one another. They know that, and, and they will confess with their mouth uh, uh, that they need to do that. And, and sometimes they will even uh, uh, say one to another, I'm sorry. Down deep in their heart, they'll say, I'm sorry, but I'm sure not going to forget. I will not forget. I will not forgive. If you can't forget, you haven't forgiven. And you need to understand that it's important to come to the place where your life and slate is clean in the spirit and there is nothing that you hold in rebellion or resentment or hateful thoughts or deeds against another, or certainly not against those in the kingdom of God. Now, Paul goes on now in verse number 6, and what does he say? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. When the Lord takes me through hard places, and, and brings me through them, and walks me through victoriously, and I come out the other side, and look back, and I say, Ooh, I'm glad I went through that, but I sure don't want to go through it again and acknowledge that we learn something from it. And we find that we can honestly look unto the Heavenly Father and say, Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for not letting me slip away into that deep sin. Thank you, Lord, for guiding me back into the pathway in which I lost and I diverted from. And Lord, bring me to that place wherein I can be the pure and the, and the son that you can be proud of or the daughter that you can be proud of. Lord, I thank you for loving me. That's the attitude we need to have when we're going through hard times. In fact, I found it very helpful when I'm facing things that I don't know how to handle. 
I don't know what to do with it. I don't know why I'm going through it. I don't know how it came about. It. I don't know why it's come upon me. All those thoughts go through our mind, don't they? And uh, I've faced those things, uh, and, and I've come to the place where even now as I face them, I say, Lord, uh, uh, I know that you love me. I know you love me, Lord, and so whatever it takes, I want you to bring me back into line with where you want me to be. But Lord, do it quickly. Get this thing over with. Let's not drag this thing out. Lord, I want to learn quickly, and let's get it over with. And you'll be amazed how that helps you to guide yourself back into the Word, into your prayer life, into submission before God, into your reverence of God and, and the Lord, and, and unto a hunger for the Word of God and the knowledge of His uh, Spirit uh, is enlarged and enlightened unto you through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. And what a privilege it is uh, to have the knowledge that whatever we're facing, uh, God is allowing it, uh, if not bringing it on directly, he is allowing it uh, uh, to lead us into the straight and narrow wherein we will be blessed and glorify his name as a faithful son or daughter of God. And we can rejoice that we have a heavenly father that loves us enough to Give us the chastisement, the correction, the rebuke that we may need that we might not lose out with him. We've been taught, you know, God loves you so much. He's not going to let anything come on you to harm you or to uh, test you or to let you go through difficult or hard times. He's just going to preserve you, and keep you from all tr trouble and care. Uh, he's going to be a wonderful, loving, heavenly father. And uh, uh, he's not going to chasten. He's not going to rebuke. He's just going to put his loving arms around you. And how often I've heard pastors and other Christians who ought to be more mature than they are uh, say, it's okay, brother. God understands. God knows. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, don't you believe that for a minute. If God is dealing with you about something, it's not okay. If the Holy Spirit is leading you away from a certain uh, activity within your life or a position in your uh, thoughts or attitude, uh, you need to know uh, that it's important. And you need to know that it is the love of God that is directing you into the narrow pathway. Uh, I have lived long enough in the ministry uh, to watch families grow and, and rear their children. And there are families who are strict with their children. And sometimes they say, Pastor, I think maybe I'm too strict. I think that's pretty hard to believe if you really are uh, loving them and watching out for their concern as you correct them and deal with them. If you're striking out at them because of anger or because of embarrassment they may have caused to you, and it's really a personal uh, vendetta against the child, then that's a different story. But I'm talking about um, uh, men and women who have uh, raised their families on the theory that I'm not going to discipline them. I'm not going to correct them. Uh, I, yes, uh, uh, I endured uh, uh, the rod, as it were, when I was a child, and my parents were strict with me, and I'm not going to be that way with my children. I'm going to let them have a better life. And what do they do? They grow up. They raise their children. Their children are rebellious. They're resentful. They have no respect for their parents. Uh, they go out into the ways of the world, and they sin against God. And by the grace of of God and multitudes of prayers from the, the, the parents that don't understand why their children are where they are, uh, come to the point uh, wherein they have to say, I should have been more strict and I should have listened to my parents as they told me, if you don't break that child of what they're doing today when they're young, you'll never change them when they get older. I want you to know that's true. And so, be thankful that we are, as we come into the kingdom of God, first of all, babes in Christ. Then we mature a little bit with God's teaching and tutoring and, and rebuke and challenging and, and uh, uh, giving us opportunity to be corrected and chastised through his word and the Holy Spirit. And then we grow a little bit and we become um, uh, teenagers, as it were, in spirit. 
And the same thing goes on, and we learn new things, and we see the world, and we see the Scripture in a greater enlarged understanding. And again, we go through it. And then all through life, we go through uh, times, uh, it seems like seasons, uh, wherein uh, there's a season of chastening and correction and rebuke, and, and sometimes hardness comes uh, uh, in our behalf uh, from the Father. And we say, Father, I don't understand. You know I love you. And the Father says, yes, I know, but I, I have to break that carnal spirit. I have to break that sin of the flesh that it wants to enjoy. And I have to bring you to the point where you crucify the flesh, where you take up your cross, and we've talked about that in the past, where you take up your cross and follow me. And so he continues to take us through those seasons of correction, and we need to rejoice in that and say, thank you, Father, because you love me enough, you care enough to keep my feet in the straight and narrow pathway of righteousness that leads to life eternal. Thank you, Lord. And I hope that as you've listened to this, uh, uh, this day, you too can say, thank you, Lord, and uh, enter into a relationship with the Heavenly Father and your Lord and Redeemer that brings you into a complete and, and uh, uh, undefiled pathway of God that is pure and clean because God loves you enough uh, to correct you, to rebuke you, to instruct you, and you need to be thankful that he loves you as he does. And so with that, it's time for us to turn our way to communion. And just as we go into communion, uh, Gene Bailey is going to minister to us in song while we prepare for it. And when the song is complete, we'll return and serve communion together with you. So get your cup and your bread prepared, and uh, we will eat together and drink together in just a few minutes.
Now let us enter into uh, communion as we read the portion of Scripture given unto us by the Apostle Paul as he gives uh, instruction in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And we read these words beginning with verse number 23. He says, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread, and as we do, we hold it before the Lord, and we ask God's blessing upon our sharing and communion today with him. Praise his name. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this food and the symbol of the broken body of your only begotten Son, our Lord and Redeemer. And as we turn unto you, Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for the price that you paid for us, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so we give you praise and thanksgiving as we eat together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us eat. Now verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us take the cup. Heavenly Father, as we hold the juice of the vine within our hands, we ask you to bless it. We acknowledge that it represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for our sin that we might be uh, completely clean and pure and forgiven, cleansed through the blood of the Lamb. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise His wonderful name. Let us drink together. Hallelujah. Now just before we close... Um, Stephen Spaulding is going to present a number for us, and I trust you'll enjoy his ministry today. If you need a friend to count on, call on him. And when you're sick, or down or lonely, call on Him. Jesus waits to be your guide with His arms stretched open wide. He's the answer to your plea. Please call on Him. Be lonely or be ye needy. When you're searching, when you're sinking, be ye fearful or be ye failing. Jesus loves you, he will bless you, call on him. So if you need a friend to count on, count on him. 
when you're sick or down or lonely, call on Him. Cause Jesus waits to be your guide with His arms held open wide. He's the answer to your plea. Please call on Him. When you're failing, be ye fearful, or be ye ailing. Jesus loves you, and He'll bless you, cause He loves you, yes He'll bless you. He's the answer to your plea, please call on Him. Now, Heavenly Father, as we close the service, we ask you to uh, just put the Word of God deep within our heart, within our mind and spirit. Cause us, Lord, to abide in the knowledge that when we're facing the hard place, that you're there with us, but at the same time, it may be permitted or caused by your chastising or uh, your directing our life. Uh, uh, trying to bring us into a place of uh, a submission under the throne of God, the love of God. Uh, and Lord, whatever it is, we ask you to make it real unto us. Give us the courage to face it with a joyful spirit uh, and cause us to be able to walk in the righteousness of our wonderful Lord and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ, uh, throughout the days ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name now as we close this study, and we give you praise for it in the glory and the beauty of His righteousness. Amen. Praise the Lord. You have been listening to Christian Living 101 with Pastor Gene Applegate. This study is presented without church or organizational bias. We are totally supported by your prayers and generosity. Your comments and questions are welcome. Email us at gene at christianliving101.org or write to Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. That's gene at christianliving101.org or write us at Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050.